Welcome to this afternoon session of the ELD MOOC. Welcome to session number six on, particip on participatory evaluation methods using the case of Madagascar. I'm very happy to have Dr. Daniel Plugov of the University of Hamburg today on board, who will share his experiences on working in Madagascar. I am Claudia Musekamp, and I'm the online tutor for this MOOC, and I will be hosting this afternoon's session on uh, evaluation methods. Uh, we'll take your questions in the chat and uh, towards the end of the uh, afternoon session also via audio. So if you have a question, put that uh, in the chat box. Um, before I uh, hand over to Dr. Daniel Plugge, um, I would uh, like to ask you a question about uh, stakeholders. Um, we will um, we are talking in in this uh, assignment, and then the last couple of weeks we have talked a lot about uh, stakeholders and. Uh, stakeholders who have a say in uh, the, the land management and in the uh, scenarios you are envisioning. And um, so I was uh, wondering what, what would you think? In which phase of an ELD or sustainable land sustainable land management project would you involve uh, stakeholders? Would you do that in the concept phase uh, very early on? Would you do that in planning? Uh, would you do that during the pro project or in uh, evaluation or in all phases? So please uh, tell us more about what you think uh, when a stakeholder should be involved. I see more people have joined us. Welcome to all of those who just joined. I see Janek joining Gernot Gauger. Welcome to the course. So please join in our poll on stakeholders. I see Cho Cho. Welcome to the class. Prashant, welcome. Melanie. Please, um, please join in our, um, this uh, poll. Uh, Ephraim is writing the polls, does not appear in your monitor. Um, actually, um, I don't know why. Um, because I see replies coming in. Um, I'm sorry if it's a question of internet connection or settings in your computer. Um, uh, it may be related to settings in the computer. So, okay, we I think we have to leave it as it is. Okay, so what uh, from what I've seen, we have um, a strong uh, lot of people who favor uh, to include uh, stakeholders in uh, during the entire project from concept to evaluation and getting feedback from them uh, to make um, projects a real uh, success, su success. And we have uh, um, uh, a small group who uh, believes that uh, including stakeholders in planning is already uh, 
very um, important to the success of a, a project. So I'm really looking forward uh, to learning how our stakeholder involvement worked in the case of Madagascar. I will have to turn over. Up. Uh, and I'm happy to welcome a very distinguished speaker today, Dr. Daniel Plugge from the University of Hamburg. Dr. Plugge holds a master's degree in wood science and technology from the University of Hamburg in Germany. He then worked on a de deforestation project in uh, the north of Brazil. Uh, after that, he joined the Institute of World Forestry based in Hamburg, where he received his PhD um, with um, a dissertation on um, monitoring methods for the REDD um, program also working in Madagascar, and he's worked there on sustainable land management projects. Um, I should say that the University of Hamburg is one of the leading universities in Germany working um, on climate change research uh, from various uh, perspectives. So welcome with me, uh, Daniel Plugge from the Institute of World Forestry, please. Okay, um, thank you, Claudia. Um, well, I'm uh, very happy to uh, welcome you to this uh, session for the six weeks of uh, this uh, amazing MOOC experience. And um, uh, it's really a pleasure for me to talk to you today and to share some insights from uh, my experiences, which I've made in Madagascar especially as I'm going to talk today about a running research project. So that's a project which is currently under progress. And I think that may be uh, of interest to you because uh, you are in the six week about to design your research plan. So this may be uh, kind of helpful to you if you see how a project is really evolving at the moment. Um, as you can see by the title, um, uh, I'm not really living up to what was said before that it would be about participatory evaluation methods. It's more about participatory scenario development, uh, which in the end, uh, of course, also leads to participatory evaluation. Um, I was also very happy to see your responses in the poll because that actually goes uh, hand in hand with my experiences. It is, of course, very important to involve stakeholders in all phases of um, a project. So um, to jump in into uh, this presentation today, um, I'm going to talk about uh, a project which is called um, Participatory uh, Research to Support Sustainable Land Management on the Mahafali Plateau in Southwest Madagascar. A short, short title would be Sulama. And you can already see by the wording of the title, title that uh, the word participatory is rather stressed here. However, I do have to admit, especially as uh, a forester, that I'm not really the expert on participatory research methods. Um, we can do some sort of participatory monitoring or um, participatory mapping. Um, but uh, to give you an idea about what I mean with participatory when talking about this uh, today, uh, it is the inclusion of stakeholders uh, at every point of the project and whenever and wherever um, possible. Um, darf ich nochmal uh, shortly interrupt? Uh, yeah. Bitte noch einmal das, uh, den Ton ein bisschen lauter stellen. Geht das? Okay. I try to 
That's the volume. Is it better now? Uh, does it work better? Oder ein bisschen lauter sprechen. Okay, uh, then I will uh, speak uh, somewhat louder. I think uh, that will be uh, the better opportunity, as I don't know about the settings here. Um, at least my volume is set to the max. So, okay. Um, as I was saying, uh, participatory means uh, involving stakeholders whenever possible and to the extent feasible. This is uh, especially true when you uh, having a project, as you can see it here, which is funded by our Federal Ministry of Education and Research, and uh, which is running for five years. Because if you are applying for such a big grant, you have to come up with a research plan beforehand. And this research plan involves all the steps you want to really do in the field from the beginning on. If you really want to do a participatory research, the first step would be to go into this area and to talk to the people, to build up trust, to um, get to know the situation and to kind of have a democratic call on what the local stakeholders really want to have done as a research and how you can implement this research. And you can think that, uh, uh, or you can imagine that uh, giving a research grant of five years with a research plan beforehand, it is not possible to write something like, okay, in the first year we will look how everything works out and then we will define our research. So I, I don't want to blame uh, the ministry or any other funding agency on this right now. I just want to explain why participatory research in this case really means the involvement of stakeholders to the best extent, extent possible. Okay, uh, so uh, here you see uh, that our project is running in two phases. Um, the first phase is a so-called research phase, which should have been finished uh, by the end of last year. But as we are working closely together with uh, the stakeholders and we are getting the constant feedbacks, we are always uh, experiencing that we might have missed out something. And so the research phase is not yet completely over. There's still some research going on in the on the ground. However, we are already starting our implementation phase. Um, and uh, if you have a look at the consortium, you can see that we are made of, uh, uh, that we are having a consortium exist, uh, uh, consisting of many German universities from Cottbus, from Greifswald, from Göttingen, Marburg, uh, Kassel, uh, and University of Hamburg. And we do have our Malagasy research partners from the University of Tuliara and the University of Antananarivo. But uh, especially for the implementation phase, very important are our non-scientific partners. That's being uh, especially the WWF in Germany and in Madagascar. Um, then we have two Malagasy NGOs, Vahatcha and Madagascaria Vokac. And we have the National Authority for the National Parks in Madagascar as well as having a memorandum of understanding with the GIZ environmental program in Madagascar. And this really gives us hope that after we will finish with our project in 2015, that uh, or in the end of 2015, that some of the things that we have researched and tried to implement with those partners, that they will be maintained even after the project runs out. So uh, yet another reason to really involve uh, stakeholders to uh, extend as far as possible uh, to really be able to maintain results of projects in the area you're working in. Uh, maybe just, just to complete this, uh, Sulama is not an ELD case study as such. But when you're working on sustainable land management, it is uh, rather intrinsic that you will also work on the topic of land degradation. 
Okay, just uh, for those of you who are not into research in Madagascar, I wanted to show you that from this funding measure, uh, there are more projects uh, worldwide, and maybe someone of you finds himself close to one of these locations indicated on this global map. So if so, or just out of interest, you are really welcome to uh, look up uh, the website. The link is uh, provided in the south of this uh, global map. Uh, so go there and check out the other projects, like, for example, the Future of Kobanuko, where Thomas Falk, who is with us today, is also working in. Um, just a little excursion before I really go into the details of our project, because I've seen uh, in the MOOC and in the groups that uh, many of you are really working uh, more on a small scale. And sometimes people tend to think that uh, small scale is not really important. We as Sulama are working uh, on the third smallest area of this whole funding measure. But however, we uh, try to develop solutions for sustainable land management on dry areas. And uh, if you see this card here from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, you can see where dry areas exist worldwide. Of course, uh, Sulama is not developing solutions for all these dry areas. And this is why we made a little model just uh, to see to which areas might be affected through climate change in a way that they may end up in a situation that our project area is already in. And doing so, you see here the, the map for Sub-Saharan Africa, you see that there are really an awful lot of areas which may face the same challenges as uh, our project areas uh, faces right now. And this is only Sub-Saharan Africa, it also spreads over to uh, South America and for the right side for the fuel in intensive A1 scenario, it even goes up to the, to the south of Spain. So I really want to encourage you, uh, even if you're working on a small scale, please think big because your results may be important to other peoples, uh, to, to other initiatives worldwide and I think that uh, especially the ELD initiative is really a very good platform and a very good, um, very good uh, opportunity to share your experiences on your research. It was actually this little model that uh, gave us the first contact with the ELD initiative. And I think without this attempt to think big from a Sulama perspective, uh, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. So thinking big really matters. Okay, now let's jump into, into uh, the beautiful island on, of Madagascar. You can see on the top right of this map, you can see um, the uh, uh, Madagascar area. And um, on the southwest, you can see our project area. If you look a bit more to the left, you have a bigger part, uh, which already sh shows one of the distinct features of our project area. And that is the National Park Simanam Pitsuts. Uh, that's the name of the National Park. It took me quite a while to, to get it pronounced. Um, so uh, having a national park inside your project area has uh, some well consequences for your project. On the one hand, you are in the lucky situation that you have an idea about the potential natural vegetation. On the other hand, this means that for developing uh, scenarios for uh, sustainable land management, you only have a restricted amount uh, of space available because uh, the core areas of the national park are, of course, prohibited for any agricultural uh, or animal husbandry um, uh, activities. However, as you might have seen uh, in the talk of Hans Huni, uh, sometimes people don't really respect these laws and regulations and they still do their agriculture inside these national parks. Now, if you go to the left uh, map, the, the bigger map on the left side, you can see our, um, I try to indicate it here, our uh, area, our study sites, this uh, red 
red construction here. This is where we do have our environmental research sites going on uh, and where we are conducting uh, more or less uh, qualitative and quantitative surveys. And then you see the blue dots and these blue dots are our research villages. And uh, we are kind of having a baseline survey of all these villages and um, we have conducted research in these villages, but we are focusing on uh, four main villages and that is on the uh, literal area, it is this village here of Beerloop, then it's the village of Ifuts, which is down here. Uh, also hosting the Bureau of the National Park Authority. Then on the plateau area, we have uh, Andremba as a village and we do have Miransu as a village. So uh, this does mean that in these villages, we do have uh, our key partners, our key stakeholders. And uh, whenever I'm talking about local communities, today I'm talking about the uh, inhabitants of these villages, because these are the people that we are really working uh, strongly with. Another important point for these villages is uh, that, uh, especially under, under the participatory perspective, is uh, that we have installed so-called socio-organizers in these villages. Um, these are Malagashi uh, people working for the project who live in the villages with the local villagers and who keep us informed about what is going on in the villages, whether there are some, uh, for example, marriages or, or other uh, activities or, or also funerals, uh, but they also uh, hold the contact to the villagers from our side. So they uh, hand over information about intended researchers, about uh, intended meetings with the villagers. And these uh, social organizers are a very integral part when uh, we are talking about participation in our project. So um, keeping contact with uh, the stakeholders on a regular basis is really uh, very important if you want to work in a participatory manner. Now, um, the initial setting for our project, I uh, thought that I might show you a little movie, but uh, this doesn't seem to be uh, appropriate due to uh, technical constraints. So I'm going to talk through this and uh, maybe later I will provide you with a link to this YouTube video. Um, so the initial setting is that we are working in a semi-arid zone, which is characterized, characterized by uh, as one of the most unique and biologically diverse drylands on Earth. Uh, as you all know, Madagascar is a biodiversity hotspot with a high rate of endemism. And this is also true for our project areas, especially when it comes to plants, to reptiles and to insects. Um, just a little uh, thing on this nice turtle down here that's only living in our project uh, area and this is heavily sought after in the pet trade market, illegal pet trade market, uh, that is, uh, especially for the US, Asia, but also for, for Europe. And uh, people are paying horrendous amounts of money for getting hold of one of these turtles. However, as it, as it is part of the U, IUCN red list, it is not allowed to be breed and traded legally by the local population. So this regulation of the UN, U, IUCN uh, red list really uh, avoids a possible alternative income to the local population. Okay, besides natural beauty, uh, we do have uh, some social settings uh, in our project area and that is uh, that uh, you may know Madagascar is one of the poorest countries on earth with a major part of the population living below the poverty line of two dollars per year uh, and from this poor country our area is even one of the poorest. And uh, also climatically, this uh, area is not that 
well uh, advantaged. Uh, sorry, don't know what's going on there. Um, we have do have recurrent droughts, but not only droughts, but also uh, frequent cyclones that are hitting the shoreline. Uh, and this uh, also impacted collaborators of Sulama as they were uh, losing their houses. Uh, so as in many drylands, uh, we have a high exploitation of natural resources and this goes oftentimes hand in hand with a low level of uh, development. Um, and of course, uh, the land use is uh, not uh, to be termed sustainable because we have an extensive agriculture, which is relying heavily on slash and burn activities. Uh, and the production cycle uh, of these fields uh, differs a bit from the literal, where it is around about uh, three to five years to uh, the plateau area where we do have more abundant rainfall and better soils. Uh, and there it might even be some 20 years. Um, the regeneration of abundant field is something which we are researching at the moment. Um, that uh, is the information given by the villagers is that regeneration of abandoned field to some sort of secondary shrub or forest vegetation takes up to 30 years. Uh, we do have a high literacy rate, uh, just uh, about 90%, so education is definitely an issue. And we do have a massive population growth with 70% of the local uh, population being below 15 years. So this all ends up into uh, very limited livelihood options for the uh, population. Um, and uh, has impacts on the society, which itself is uh, characterized by traditional customs and uh, strong social cohesion, meaning that um, uh, the, the society itself or, or the people have high belief in their ancestors, uh, which means that they are even setting aside uh, parts of the land uh, to, for their ancestors so they may be able to grow crops there and uh, also setting aside parts of the forest as sacred forests so for the souls of the ancestors to live in there which from a uh, conservation point of view is of course a good thing to do and which keeps ecosystem services kind of uh, functional in these areas furthermore we do have a lot of taboos so things not to do named fadi uh, in this area uh, which are changing from village to village and from even sometimes within the villages and uh, so uh, one of these parties for example is that some people are not allowed to pick up uh, the manure of uh, cows or goats to use it as a fertilizer on the fields this is something which we had to learn because fertilizing the fields would make absolute sense but if people are not allowed to do so uh, you have to take this into account into your research uh, and to look for, for other options. Uh, luckily, not everyone is not allowed to do so, so uh, there's kind of a, a workaround for this. But of course, working participatory means also really getting a grip on these uh, traditional customs and uh, on these taboos that exist in this area. So um, this is uh, now the setup of Sulava. I don't go, want to go into details with this. I just want to show that we are working with seven different work packages, each one with its own field, and that each work package tries to work as closely with, uh, together with people as possible. And this, of course, works very well uh, and is necessary for the social cultural uh, work package and the socio-economic work package. But also the people from uh, the agricultural agri uh, agriculture work package and animal husbandry work packages do have their key resource persons they are working with for applying their research experiments on the ground. So you have to identify persons who are really willing to set aside a part of the land uh, to uh, do some agricultural research on that. 
Uh, I myself am working uh, in the ecosystem and functions work package, so work package four, which I already said, we try to involve uh, local people in the assessment of these ecosystem services and functions, and we rely on them as they know all the names of the species, and we then will have to translate them into scientific names. So uh, all these work packages um, work on the current forms of land use and try to come up with ideas and scenarios together with these uh, stakeholders for a sustainable land management plan. And we approach this uh, by a inter and uh, uh, transdisciplinary research. And uh, interdisciplinary research may be clear to all of you. Uh, that means working uh, between scientific uh, disciplines uh, or together from dis different scientific disciplines on a specific topic and identifying the interlinkages. Transdisciplinary research uh, in our case means working outside of the science sphere, going out, working with local people, working with regional stakeholders and local stakeholders. And this uh, always uh, has a lot to do with communication. So uh, it's sometimes even hard if uh, scientists from different disciplines talk to each other, but if you go as a scientist outside of your comfort zone and talk to, in inverted comment, real world people, um, then uh, it really gets uh, sometimes awkward to get your message over. So this really takes time, takes uh, a lot of patience and it takes constant feedbacks from your local stakeholders and your lo and the local people uh, for gaining insights uh, into their situations, into their mode of living, and to integrate their rights, needs, and customs as well as a traditional knowledge into your research. And by this, foster mutual learning process, which, which is absolutely important if you uh, want to discuss with them the different steps of your experiments. Uh, I have named here a few, like uh, the application of drought-resistant plants and the fertilization with my manure, which I also mentioned. And now in the following, following I'm going to focus on the production of Samata as an uh, option for fodder for livestock in the region. So, um, what is the situation for this uh, alternative scenario of Samata production as fodder for livestock? We do have a high amount of livestock in the project area with goats, sheep, and poultry, which are used on the local markets um, for trade, but of course they are also used for the meat production for the households and families. Uh, but we also do have a large amount of seaboos, um, which are mainly used as a sign of social status, meaning that they are not traded on any official market while having a big impact on the ecosystem. Um, what is done uh, sometimes is that uh, they are traded between someone and someone else as a form uh, of a loan, uh, but then they will be giving back later. Some of these seaboos are used uh, for, for traditional customs uh, or for, for rituals. And uh, they are also used for, for, uh, for pulling the, the ox carts. But uh, as I said, they are not really used uh, in, a, in a commercial way. They are not sold on markets, markets as such. Um, and if you are the owner of a big herd of seaboos, you are a very important uh, person in this area. And the thing is that when you die, most of your seaboos will be killed because the horns of the seaboos will be set on your grave as a sign of your social status to the time when you were living. So in the area, you will see a lot of graves, a lot of tombs with a lot of seabo horns on them. And you may discuss this, whether this is uh, sensible or not, but these are the traditions in this region with which we have to cope. Um, 
So, uh, of course, these high amount of uh, CBOOs do have an impact on the ecosystem, that's already said. And uh, to uh, lessen the impact of uh, this, um, uh, the, the CBOOs on the ecosystem, uh, there's a traditional tr activity of transhumance. I will show you a card of the areas of transhumance uh, after this slide. And this transhumance starts when the young men of the literal villages gather, gather all the zebus and uh, go with them along a trail towards a plateau area where we do have more abundant rainfall, where the rainfall starts area, uh, earlier meaning that there is more fodder available for the seabrees. And this allows uh, the pastures in the littoral area to regrow and also forms a social link and an exchange between the littoral and the plateau area uh, in terms that um, the young men from the littoral oftentimes find their wives on the plateau area. So there's a, a nice social ex change between these two areas. Uh, when the rainy season ends on, in the littoral area, uh, the sea boosts are gathered again and brought back to the littoral. And this tr twice, doing this trade twice a year certainly has a high impact on the regeneration and on of the forest and on the forest structure along the transect of transhumance. And that is what we are actually uh, researching in our work package, uh, this kind of impact and where we are working closely together with key persons who can identify which uh, plants are impacted and what these plants are used for, whether they, they are used only for fuel wood, whether they are used for contra constructions, or if they have uh, medicinal meaning or ritual, ritual meaning, so that we get an idea about uh, the whole structure of the vegetation and what we might have to include if we want to come up with something like a, a participatory forest management or a community-based forest management plan. So on this card, you can see here the uh, situation where it starts. Uh, this is the literal area where people start along this trail of transhumance. This is not the only one, but this is the one we decided to follow uh, towards the plateau area. And uh, when the rainy season ends in the literal area, they go back again along this trail of transhumance. Okay, now, uh, so far, so good. Uh, problem is that we are living uh, in a changing environment and that due to climate, fa uh, climate change, the rainfall becomes more and more unpredictable. And uh, this uh, adds high uncertainty to the timing of the activity of transhumans, meaning that uh, the people don't really know when to start with this activity. Just last year, they decided to start their transhumans even before the rainfall started in the littoral area because uh, um, it, the pastures in the littoral area were, were, were simply no longer providing fodder for the zebus. And they went to the plateau area. However, because of a very late start of the rainfall, there hasn't been any rainfall on the plateau area either. So that really aggravates uh, the problems of overgrazing, which you then have at the end of the uh, dry period before the rainfall starts. And especially for the plateau area, we have a new phenomena or rather new phenomena that there are a lot of cattle thieves coming in meaning uh, that they are with weapons really uh, attacking the herders of the seabrews and taking away the seabrews to sell them on the markets in Tulia or even in Antananarivo, in the capital. And uh, this really has some severe consequences that uh, because of um, this fear of, of cattle thieves and not knowing when to start with the transhumance, uh, the people from the uh, littoral area don't start their transhumance and the people from the plateau area start to do an inverse transhumance, meaning that they are leading their cattle towards the littoral area. This, of course, ends up 
but in the fact that there will be no time for regeneration of the natural pastures in the lateral zones. Um, so a very high uh, impact on the ecosystem, uh, high overgrazing, high pressure on the ecosystem, and uh, a lot of the land degradation going on. And uh, also very critical to cultural values is that there now is for the first time an incentive for selling the seaboos. And this is really something which hasn't happened so far, that people, due to the threat of cattle thieves, are thinking about selling their seaboos on a local market. So uh, now we could think that we are smart and say, okay, this is uh, something which we are supporting because the seaboos are there anyway and they are of a certain value for the market and they're more valuable than goats or sheep or poultry. Uh, but we do have to respect the traditional customs of these people. Uh, we cannot try to change uh, their customs if we really want to work in a participatory manner. So uh, we have to come up with other solutions. And the solutions, uh, or the solution that we are working on at the moment is uh, that we are promoting or that we are looking into a scenario and working on a scenario on how to promote uh, Samata, so this, this tree, uh, as a fodder plant. You can see in the pictures, you, you see some nice uh, Samata trees standing there. It is one of the few trees that is really abundant in this area and that grows fast. And people only use the leaves of this area as fodder, so they don't cut the whole tree, they only cut the, the leaves and the tree stays alive. So that makes it uh, uh, feasible for, for a long period, for, for a long time. And we are just picking up this idea because there are already first incentives going on. Uh, for the cultivation of Samata. However, these look, uh, uh, or, or these are uh, undertaken in a way that uh, people go into the forest, they dig out Samata trees and they plant them in their backyard because planting trees or tree plantations are only allowed on private property. You cannot plant a tree wherever you want, you need to plant that on your private property. Um, so, uh, using this plant as fodder for livestock and by this taking pressure from the natural ecosystem and uh, reducing land degradation is what we are looking into and is the scenario we are working on. So, uh, together with Johannes Förster, who is also very active in the EID initiative, uh, some of my colleagues uh, developed a stepwise approach, which is actually based on the uh, TEEP uh, six-step approach, which uh, you may have come across uh, already. Um, and uh, well, the first step would be that we need to specify and agree on the problem and uh, that we have to define relevant research questions together with the stakeholders and the decision makers. The most impacted stakeholder was already identified, so that was the local community. The problems uh, were also already stated, uh, as I said, it's, uh, well, it's overgrazing, it's the impact on the natural vegetation, it's the compactment of the, of the soil, uh, all these problems that, that go in uh, hand with a with, uh, high amount of, of cattle and sea roos. And we have to look at the perception of these problems by the local population. And this is done mainly with uh, group interviews, uh, also with participatory mapping experiments and with interviews with key persons of which you can see some uh, nice pictures below. Uh, the drivers for this problem being, uh, on the one hand, the cattle thieves, on the other hand, uh, climate change. So uh, the next step would then to select the ecosystem services which are most relevant for decision making. Uh, so um, 
this would be uh, related to the livestock production and to the overgrazing or the impact on the natural vegetation. And these are listed here just so shortly for, for livestock. It's uh, uh, the meat production, it's the low social reputation, the livestock that is used for spiritual purposes may, may be impacted and also uh, livestock production as an insurance for droughts. Uh, more on the natural uh, vegetation side, it's uh, the fodder production for the livestock uh, by supplementary fodder plants. And of course, there will be, if you set up uh, plantations, there will be some impact on the water supply in this area. Now uh, I'm going to uh, give you some ideas about what is currently happening, uh, what we are currently doing, and that is uh, we uh, have asked uh, what, uh, who needs what information to uh, answer these uh, questions and how can this uh, information be assessed appropriately together with the stakeholders or with the local communities. Of course, uh, if you want to set up plantations of any species, you will know, need to know something about the growth rate and how to sustainably use this uh, species, in our case, as a matter. So what we are doing is uh, measurements in the field. Uh, we are setting up plantation experiments and we have a close look on um, the growth of the trees uh, by applying uh, so-called dendrometers, which are measuring uh, the, the growth of such a tree, uh, in our case, every, every hour. So you get a really good idea about the growth processes of this tree. And by this, you get an idea about how, to, uh, how you can sustainably use the Samata tree. Then, of course, we would have to know uh, the number of animals that are in this area and how the herding works. And this is done by a colleague of mine, which you can see to the left, uh, to the right side. Uh, it's Tobias Feld, who had to build up mutual trust with the herders and uh, they let him join uh, on their daily routine, going with the Cebus, also going along the trail of transhumans and recording the itineraries. Uh, he used his uh, GPS collars, uh, which were applied around the necks of the Cebus, which you may see in, in this picture on the left, um, which the her herders actually said might uh, be preventive of cattle thieves. Um, and uh, yeah, by this we, we got an idea about uh, how the herding goes on and uh, what type of fodder these animals eat and uh, also the impact on, on the natural vegetation. Um, then uh, if we are promoting Samata as fodder, we would have to know whether this is really feasible or not, because if Samata does not have a high energetic value, uh, we would have to uh, skip this scenario. Uh, so we did experiments on the feed intake and on the digestions. Uh, you can see to the right a uh, rather unusual picture of goats with diapers. Um, we didn't have uh, cebus with diapers because these diapers would have been very big. So uh, very, very big. So so we we had to stick with the goats. Uh, and you can imagine that for farmers in that region coming up with such an idea that you put some diapers around their goats is really, well, it takes time to, to convince them and to, to really uh, build up the mutual understanding that this is a necessary step to do to help them in their situation or to come up with a scenario that uh, may help them in their situation. Uh, lastly, um, uh, of course, I already said the water impact of any uh, tree plantation. Uh, you may know this from the discussion uh, around eucalypt trees. Um, uh, the, for this, we, we are doing plantation and experiments and we are also trying now to do some tree ring analysis and link these data with climate data to 
uh, see how much water Samatha really needs for growing and uh, how dependent it is on climate. Um, so with all these nice informations, uh, we can then really build up our scenario and uh, come up with a policy option uh, that is, of course, the support of uh, alternative or supplementary fodder supply by the Samata tree. And all the knowledge that we have gathered, we feed into a so-called soft model, which shows the interlinkages between the input and the output and uh, all the actors involved. I'm going to show a little uh, part of this uh, soft model on the next slide. Uh, and from the soft model, we can also say something about the changes which are expected in the flow of the ecosystem ser services through the scenario. That is, of course, the further availability, the number of livestock that can be sustained, the protection of the natural vegetation, and uh, the trade-off between the water availability and a higher number of livestock. So uh, this is our current research. This is how far we are. And uh, as said, we are seeking constant feedback of the local population. So with the understanding that we have now about the situation, we will go into our villages, uh, I think starting in June, and uh, we will have village meetings uh, or meetings with the key persons. and. Uh, really gathering their feedback on what we are thinking might be feasible for the promotion of, of Samata in the area. And um, if, they, if we are missing something or if we are not right, we will need to adapt the model to the situation as perceived by the local population. And after this, we can come up with uh, the development and the parameterization of a real model that is running on computers and will give us uh, some qualitative and quantitative output. Okay, um, now there comes uh, the part of the economic evaluation, which is then be done inside this, this model. Um, and that is the assessment of possible social and ecological impacts and who benefits and who are the beneficiaries. So uh, if you remember the talk of Hannes Etter two weeks ago, uh, he uh, introduced us into uh, the um, use values and non-use values. And uh, here we do see um, some use values. Uh, that is a direct use value of the increase in fodder production which uh, me ends up in a lower meat price, uh, meaning more meat for villages. And uh, this can be assessed by the non-demand-based non method of uh, market prices. Then uh, we will have an increase of social reputation by a higher number of livestock. And this is something I really would like to put into the discussion because social reputation of a single person or to evaluate social reputation of a single person, I think is something which is uh, difficult to do. But maybe some of you have, have a good idea about this. For, for big enterprises, there are clear signs of linkages between economic success and social reputation, but for a single person, um, that is something I would really like to discuss with you afterwards. And we do have the insurance function, which increases by increasing livestock, and that can also be measured by uh, the market price. Uh, we don't expect this, a change of the spiritual purposes, which livestock is used for, because that is only a small amount of animals that is needed. And uh, we see a reduction of the, sorry, a uh, reduction of the uh, pressure on uh, natural vegetation uh, and uh, a reduction of the water supply, which can be measured by replacement costs, which in this high area will be rather high. Um, now, with all this knowledge and uh, after performing the, no the, the model, uh, we can integrate the information 
into a decision support for different stakeholders, that being, of course, the local communities, but also the NGOs and the development corporations we are working with. And we are thinking about uh, proposals of different Samata production strategies, because I said so far, Samata plantations are working only on private lands, uh, but there's, of course, more space on uh, communal areas, so this might be another option or another strategy for applying this uh, Samata scenario. And, of course, we do have uh, to come up with some participatory education methods on the possible impact um, of this scenario, uh, being the trade-off between water availability, availability and the number of livestock and uh, limited uh, capacity of ecosystems to support the livestock. And in the far future, after our project, runs out uh, some successes of us can then uh, assess some indicators for the success or the failure of this uh, scenario which we have developed and that is done by the change of the number in livestock and spatial distribution or that can be done or will be done however uh, you can assess uh, the change of the water availability and it will be able to change uh, to, to assess the change of the natural vegetation and biodiversity uh, quantitatively and qualitatively. Okay, coming to the conclusions. Um, alternative scenarios for tackling land degradation issue, issues from my point of view or from our point of view really need to be developed together with local stakeholders from the beginning on uh, and therefore participation is really integral because you need to understand the local situation you need to build up trust you need to integrate the local knowledge of the people and you have definitely to respect their traditions, their rights, and their customs. And all of this needs to be fed into your research, into your research questions. If you simply go back to your office and do any kind of research, the question is, how realistic is the pathway that you are proposing in the end? So this creation of soft models and the validation of the feedback and discussion with the local population is really there to identify these realistic pathways for future development, which in the end will then have an impact on the local communities. However, not all steps of science need to be shared with the local stakeholders. Uh, there's no need to inform them on how to program model, models or how climate change scenarios are working or every single step of carbon sequestration, uh, possible global carbon markets and the decline of the prices or, or whatever. So uh, you have to concentrate also uh, of, on what kind of information you're really sharing because even uh, given the high illiteracy rate, uh, communication has to be done a lot with pictures, uh, uh, with role plays and, and all these things, you can simply hand out a brochure and uh, say, okay, here, read it, and then you know everything. Um, and in the end, uh, yeah, you should, if you want to, to make an impact on uh, the local situation, you should really only conduct those models or those scenarios that are deemed appropriate by the local population, because only by doing this, you will have a real impact uh, on the livelihood of the local communities. And yeah, with this, I will end my talk and I'm looking forward to the discussion with you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Daniel, for a fascinating talk about uh, participatory uh, methods. I really enjoyed learning about your work in 
Madagascar. I see already some questions uh, popping in in the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, there were some questions uh, prepared. Um, I think we'll take uh, one or two of those and then take questions directly from the chat uh, and open the microphone. So, um, if, why don't you take the first question? It's about participatory research and uh, as a well-rounded approach, uh, what, uh, what about uh, quality control? Okay, um, well, quality control is, of course, a, a very important issue. And... Um, well, first of all, you're absolutely right with with uh, saying that this is a well-rounded, multi-stakeholder, multi-level, interdisciplinary approach. I mean, this is uh, what what you're trying to do with uh, with such a title to to get everybody on board, to get everybody involved, and then quality control really gets tricky. Um, so. Um, what we are doing or what, what I try to, to introduce is uh, that we are working closely together with NGOs which are active in this area since a long time, uh, which really have a long experience, like for example, WWF Madagascar. Um, you may have heard that there was a political turmoil uh, or turnover in Madagascar in, in 2009. Uh, just uh, when we started to, to create this project. And uh, so we, we had uh, really uh, difficulties to work with those stakeholders that we identified when we started to create the project because many funding agencies withdraw their, their, their money from Madagascar. And WWF was the agency that stayed in place and uh, that has a lot of knowledge in there. So we are working with them and we are working with uh, other local NGOs uh, who will hopefully in the end carry on uh, what we have developed in the project. Okay. Um, there's some question uh, on how did you select the uh, social organizers? How did, what role did the community play? in uh, deciding about uh, the Samata, Samata scenario? Mm. Okay, um, so the social, social organizers are selected, uh, well, mainly selected by WWF uh, Madagascar. Uh, however, there are some uh, strict criteria. They have to know the region, so they cannot come, for example, from, from Tana, where there's a different ethnic living, um, and uh, they, they have to know the area, they have to be familiar with the customs uh, and the traditions, but of course they also have to have some form of education and knowledge so that uh, they really can form the bridge between us scientists uh, and the people in the in, in the village, um, and uh, qualitatively they contribute a lot because without them, without the con constant contact to the local population, I think we would really have a hard time. You, you cannot simply appear in a in an area and say hello, here I am. I want to do research, and everybody will clap his hands. That's not the case. So um, yeah, this this is how these these organizers are, are selected. Regarding corruption corruption in info gathering processes, um, yes, of course, there's always the difficulties of overseeing marginal groups. Uh, our social scientists are very well aware of this. I am not a social scientist, so I cannot give you too many details on how they are working around this. But I know that this is a topic and that they are aware of this topic. 
Okay. And there was a question of when there are different uh, alternative scenarios that are uh, excluding each other, how would you, uh, how do you choose? Um, well, alternative scenarios that are excluding each other, um, well, if, if we are working with uh, the, the uh, local communities, of course, uh, we would present these scenarios to them. Now, there might be the situation where 50% of them say, okay, um, I opt for this, and the other 50% say, I opt for the other one. Um, then, of course, we, on the one hand, uh, have our models where we can kind of inverted commas, look into the future and maybe uh, come up uh, with some reasonable arguments for one or the other option. And uh, second thing is that, of course, we have to stick to the line uh, or, or the, the social hierarchies in these areas. So uh, it may end in the situation where the elders of a village really uh, then needs to decide which pathway to take, which way to go. Okay. And there is, uh, so from what I understand, you haven't really, uh, you are in the process of developing scenarios, not yet evaluating those. Yeah. Uh, but there's one question, what, uh, is there a chance that overplanting may be a risk? Overplanting of the Samata tree. Yes, yes, uh, that, that is uh, what, um, uh, okay, I, I think I forgot to mention it. Um, uh, yes, of course, uh, we, we do have only a limited uh, carrying capacity of this ecosystem for Samata plantations. This is why we are conducting the, the research on uh, the water use. And of course, uh, this, this area is really, um, it has only limited access to water, so water really is a bottleneck. And uh, if we now plant uh, everything with Samata, and the Samata trees will use up all the water, there will be no water left for the livestock. And uh, so, yes, uh, this definitely has to be in a, in a balanced way, uh, but we hope that we, we can avoid uh, initial overplanning by, by careful planning and by uh, looking into our models and by looking into the analysis of our research. Okay, so if there are more questions, uh, we can now questions from odd, uh, by audio. Um, I see, uh, so raise your hands. Uh, if you want to ask a question, I see that Jose has already uh, raised his hand. You find if you want to ask question via audio, there's uh, an option to do so uh, with raising your hand. It's that little hand in the top left corner of the screen. Uh, so if you want to uh, say something, um, please do so. I take uh, the first speaker and that would be uh, Jose and so please Jose um, uh, unmute your microphone and then we can hear you. Uh, I'm not an option in our area because uh, you, you don't have any connection to the mobile <laughs> net which is uh, there are places existing on Earth where you still have no mobile connection. Um, uh, but uh, of course, we are, we are intending to, to uh, work, for example, with the uh, office of Madagascar National Park. There they have a, have a computer and uh, there we, this computer we will use to, to kind of um, disse disseminate or, or to, to uh, give uh, the local people the opportunity to, to look uh, on animated movies or, or anything like that. However, uh, this is so far not developed. We, we are still uh, in, in the face of, of running the research, in the face of analysis. So uh, this is a very good opportunity and it's, uh, it's as good uh, uh, 
I like I like the idea of this, and uh, we will definitely uh, look into this and keep this in mind. Okay, thank you, thank you, Ephraim. Are there any more questions? So please raise your hand. Okay. Um, we can take more questions. If there are no questions right now, uh, uh, there's one question from Tennisop in the chat. Uh, how did you build this scenario on the production of Samata and okay. what role did the local government uh, play? Um, okay, I'm not mm. sure if I... Actually, yeah, there seems to be an audio problem. I think Jose is online. <coughs> Jose, please. Jose, please. Um, the sound is not good. Okay, so um, what we'll do, um, Daniel Plugger will stay uh, online uh, for a short while um, after his presentation now. I would like to announce next week's uh, speaker, and that will be uh, Dr. Richard Thomas uh, from the United in Nations University, the Institute for Wa Water, Environment and Health. He's a colleague of Dr. Kida Ruh, who has joined us uh, today, our main tutor. So, and he will talk about uh, cost benefit analysis. So next week we'll see you again for uh, this talk by uh, Dr. Richard uh, Thomas. So, um, I would uh, like to, at this point, say thank you to Daniel Plugger. Thanks for a great presentation. Hope to see you uh, next week online again in our uh, live session. Um, we are now up for our fun part, so open your webcams. Uh, I will...